Okay, so we're back. Um, a few few seconds of silence there at the beginning of this. All right, as I mentioned a moment ago, you know, I, I kind of get excited about this whole plate tectonics thing, and uh, a lot of that has to do with, as far as when this all really came into being and, and really took shape, which was back in the late 60s and early 1970s. And it was right after that time when I was an undergraduate, just like you folks are today. And uh, so I was actually hearing about the old way people or geologists looked at the earth and the you know hypotheses they used to, to try to explain things and was hearing how uh, this new uh, theory of, of plate tectonics that had been released was starting to address those very same things, uh, those very same features, you know, why earthquakes, big earthquakes in particular, are most prevalent in certain areas of the world, why volcanoes occur in certain places, um, just why mountain ranges of certain types in different ages and, you know, where they're relatively young versus relatively old and weathered, you know, what's going on to cause those and, and you know, why are there differences um, in the way they look and, and where they appear? And you can explain that uh, to a large extent to this, you know, using this whole theory of plate tectonics. So it, it did a lot more to explain what's present on the Earth's surface, where different resources are located, than some of the old, uh, again, hypotheses that were out there originally. So uh, it's, it's really cool. It gives a, you know, for geologists today a much clearer understanding of how this earth system works and why things happen where they do. So a uh, very cool attribute here. Now <clears throat> even though this all kind of hit the street if you will as plate tectonics in the late 60s and early 70s, um, that would be 1960s and 1970s by the way, uh, that wasn't the first time it was introduced. If you go back to the early 20th century, and this is where the chapter actually opens up, a gentleman by the name of Alfred Wegener and his colleagues actually had proposed something called the uh, hypothesis of the theory of continental drift. And the problem that they ran into um, was that anytime you introduce something that's totally new and different into you know any group, especially the scientific community, it's often you know met with a lot of skepticism. And they had a bunch of fantastic uh, evidence that went along for you know promoting their idea you know there was the fit of the continents if you you know they literally could you, know, you even today could literally take a pair of scissors on a flat map and cut out around the continental shelf regions of all different continents and then kind of slide them together into a former landmass which we now refer to as something called Pangaea okay um, there was the presence of different types of fossils on continents that are separated by thousands of miles of ocean uh, that, are, that are identical and, and that really shouldn't happen if those you know even if they're of the same type of animal they should evolve differently if they uh, you know are geographically separated um, there's geologic evidence that again in, you know indicates that something was different uh, mountain ranges that line up perfectly from one side of the Atlantic to the other and it looks like at one point in the past they were indeed formed together and you know it turns out they probably were based on what we believe today there's um, also you know one of the to me one of the most compelling lines of evidence is something called paleoclimatic data in other words evidence of old climates and you see evidence of old climates such as the presence of glacial uh, activity in and around the equator. Well, how the heck does that happen? Um, yeah, that was difficult to explain. But again, if you slid all of the continents back into the position uh, using that, again, jigsaw puzzle approach, all of a sudden those parts of the equator, you know, in Africa and so forth, slid down into what is now the southern polar region. So that would allow that to be explained. So all these great lines of evidence. Oh, and the fact that you had what appeared to be evidence of tropical uh, environments that exist under the ice sheets that are now under Antarctica and yes when you slide it back Antarctica would have been what is now in the tropics so again this this thing works very well to explain a whole lot of what's going on there but Wegener and his colleagues ran into some hassle when they came up with a method for trying to propose how these things actually moved 
Well, they faltered. You know, they try to relate gravitational pull and some other forces at work, and it didn't take long for people to kind of say, no, that really won't work. So they kind of came up with some anti-hypotheses, if you will. Some of those were kind of far-fetching, like rafting and, you know, animal swimming and, and island hopping under islands that don't really exist and things like that. But anyways, um, so it, they never really disproved continental drift, but it kind of was shoved onto the back burner. But then from the time frame of the late, you know, nineteen twenties and early nineteen thirties up till the nineteen sixties, a lot happened. We learned a lot about the way the ocean flow was constructed, uh what was going on in the mid ocean ridge systems. Harry Hess uh proposed back in the early sixties, if I recall, um the the hypothesis of seafloor spreading. In other words, at the ridge systems in the center of the oceans, new material was coming up and being formed and the ocean bottoms were spreading. All of a sudden, that becomes a driving mechanism that you can actually start to move these plates around. We also tended to learn more about the internal structure of the Earth's system and the fact that the lithosphere, the hard outer physical shell of the Earth, is separated from the next hard physical uh, shell of the Earth, the lower mantle, by something called the asthenosphere, which is uh, far more plastic and gooey and, and actually gives us uh, uh, an area where you can decouple that upper plate and allow things to move around. So all these things came into play. Um, also things like magnetic reversals, you know, better understanding how those uh, existed in mapping magnetic reversal patterns on the ocean floor that actually were symmetrical around the um, those mid-ocean ridge systems, again those spreading centers, if you will, um, where you know that indicated that things were moving away from that center, and that the youngest rocks in the ocean floor around that mid-ocean ridge system, the oldest rocks are up against the continents. Okay, so <clears throat> then there was a big earthquake in 1964 in Alaska. That allowed a guy by the name of George Plafka, who was formerly with the United States Geological Survey, to go in and propose uh, or at least link Harry Hess's spreading centers with large trench areas that existed off many of the continental regions, which we now know are subduction zones. You know, all this stuff came together and finally um, formulated this plate tectonic theory, which says that the lithosphere is divided into a number of large and small plates that have been moving around with respect to one another over the last two and a half billion years. They do so, you know, and here's the three boundary settings down here at the bottom, at the spreading centers, those mid-ocean ridge centers, things are spreading apart. They're being pulled apart. At the convergent boundaries, either subduction occurs where you have oceanic material colliding with uh, continental material because one's heavier than the other, or even where ocean-ocean plates collide, one subducts below the other. Where you have continental plates and continental plates colliding, uh, which it doesn't show on this map up here, but like is what has happened over the last uh, 35 or 40 million years as India has been moving into the Asian continent, then you build something called the Himalayas because even though there's a little bit of you know material being thrust down, most of the material is being thrust up, it's being crunched together because the the continental material is much less dense than the stuff that's underneath it, so that helps buoy that material up. So all of this stuff comes together to, to help us understand things. And then we have the third boundary, a transform boundary. We have one of those off the west coast of the United States out here referred to as the San Andreas Fault System. So it just does so much to explain a lot of the physical features we see at the Earth's surface. We can also relate it to the presence of Earth resources in various ways. So, you know, plate tectonics is a really cool phenomenon. Okay, I'm going to stop this video now, and we'll go into a couple of questions. That'll be very briefly. Uh, then we'll wrap up this three-part video uh, here as part of Unit 2. And again, a little more technical clarification on that first video.